this episode of the Tennis IQ Podcast. I'm Brian Lomax. And I'm Josh Berger. One of the biggest barriers to mental toughness in tennis is that tennis players think about themselves way too much. They worry about how they're playing, what other people think, what's going to happen if they win or lose. And all of this distracts from the fact that tennis is a combat sport. It is a fight. And it, you have an opponent. To deal with the opponent requires playing with intention and playing with purpose. And I think that until players come to this realization, mental toughness will be an elusive concept at best. Absolutely. And uh, the, the need to embrace that fight and the need to acknowledge that you, it's you against the person on the other side of the net. And rather than you just having to maintain your own performance and perform at a high level, you have to respond to whatever they're doing, whatever tricks they're trying to throw, whatever, however, whatever style of play they're playing. And you have to be adaptable and be ready to adjust to whatever is going on. And you really have to embrace that fight and that battle that's, that's happening. And that's why we wanted to speak with our guest today, uh, renowned tennis coach Jorge Capistani. He's very good at articulating this concept in tennis and how we should approach matches and competition. And part of this is expressed in his model of Tennis IQ, his three levels of Tennis IQ. And to be honest, you know, that's uh, some of the inspiration for the name of this podcast. So who is Jorge Capistani? So Jorge is a USPTA master professional. He's also a PTR international master professional. He's one of 11 people to hold both of those certifications. He's also a certified mental toughness specialist through the Human Performance Institute, which is directed by Dr. Jim Lair. He's written books on tennis strategy and mental toughness in tennis, and he's worked on another book that was a collaboration with the PTR on tennis drills. As a coach, he's coached a number of players who have won high school state championships, a number of nationally ranked players, including three gold ball winners. That's not easy. Um, He's also a frequent speaker at tennis conferences around the world, and I think you'll be able to tell why through this conversation that we have with him. He also directs the professional tennis management program at Hope College in Michigan, which sounds like a really cool program if you read about it. So with that, let's listen in to our conversation with Jorge Capistani. Well, today we have a very special guest on the Tennis IQ podcast, Coach Jorge Capistani. Uh, this is a conversation I've been looking to forward to for, for a while, Josh, and um, I'm, I'm excited to have you here, Coach. Thank you so much for joining us. Wow, thank you guys. I love the idea of Tennis IQ. It was actually the first online course I ever built was titled Building Tennis IQ. So uh, I love talking about that topic. Well, to be honest, you know, when Josh and I were bandying about different names for a podcast about the mental side of tennis, you know, this was on the list, obviously. And part of it was inspired by, you know, your model of Tennis IQ. And so I definitely want to get into that. Um, But before we get into that, uh, I'd really like to hear about how you got started in tennis. I think I read something. Maybe you started to play tennis in 1974, which coincidentally uh, the same year I started to play. Yeah. Um, so actually, that's about right. I actually, it might have been a little later because in 74, it's probably when I met my friends, Ron and Ray Bentley, who introduced me uh, to tennis. I was a, a freshman in high school in 76, and that was really my first year. I said, okay, I'm going to go out for tennis. Uh, I never had played tennis, but my two friends, they were twins. Their dad was the coach, kind of became a mentor of mine. And I, you know, those, those, (laughs) I I practically lived at their house. That was that kind of friendship. And um, yeah, they played tennis and I wanted to hang out with my buddies. So I started playing tennis and my freshman year, I played football, went out for uh, basketball, did not make it. And then uh, in the spring, instead of playing baseball, which was my routine for all those years, uh, I decided to take tennis up. And uh, I made the varsity team, the last position on the team, third doubles back then. And I got a varsity letter and I had fun. I was hanging out basically with older kids because I was a freshman and most of the other people were not. So I got the bug. And after that, I was like, this is kind of fun. I I like it. So I got serious about it really after my freshman year. So I was kind of, I kind of classified myself a latecomer. Um, You know, a lot of, there's some good to being a latecomer. You kind of, go up fast right away. You know, the first six months you feel like, Oh my gosh, I'm getting so much better. This is at this rate, I'm going to be a pro, you know, and then you don't realize that, Oh, it's going to apply to all. Um, but yeah, the, uh, so that's how I got started. My, my best friends basically introduced, introduced me to it. 
Yeah, and it also sounds like you're a multi-sport athlete, which you know, even though from like a pro level perspective, that's an important aspect of um, yeah. of development. Uh, so many other things that you learn through different sports um, that can help improve your own tennis game, and I'm sure you see that with even with students you work with today. Uh, yeah, you know, it was different because back then, I mean, I'm pushing 60, I'm 50, almost, I'm halfway to 59, put it that way. <laughs> um, the way. When I grew up, the way it just happened, I mean, everybody just played outside. It was not even an option to be inside. We couldn't wait to get outside. And, um, you know, we get home from school with our school clothes and put on our play clothes and we were outside. So me and my buddies, which were basically my neighbors, my neighborhood crew, uh, we just played all kinds of sports and we love sports. And there was a park you know, I was born in Cuba and sponsored by a, a church, the Hudsonville, Michigan, which is, you know, kind of the west side of Michigan. And um, we had a park, you know, about a block from where we lived. And we just like literally lived there. I'd ride my bike there. We played. I had baseball. I didn't have tennis, interestingly enough, but it had baseball diamonds and it had soccer and tetherball. We just hung out there and played and got in trouble all day long. And um, it's quite the difference because now as a teacher, you know, I've been teaching now for close to 40 years. And um, in the first, you know, maybe 30 years ago, um, all the kids that came to me, little uh, and medium, and especially the little ones, everybody was athletically literate. I mean, they could throw a ball, they could track a ball, they could catch it, they could run and stop and balance. And over the years, slowly but surely, you know, I always say this, like if in, you know, 2000 or 1995, if I would have taken a dozen eight-year-olds and said, everybody grab a tennis ball and just throw it that way, probably all of them would have grabbed it, got a little rotation and thrown it. And now if I say that in 2020, uh, less than half know that. I mean, it's clear that this little eight-year-old boy or girl, they've never played catch. I mean, literally, they've never played catch even once. So, so they'll shock put it or they'll turn, they'll step with the wrong foot and then you know, it's kind of sad, but that's the way it's kind of become. And now as a tennis coach, we have to know that. So we spend a lot more time than I ever thought we would just with ABCs, agility, balance, coordination in their little kids' classes because, you know, they don't have gym every day. Uh, no one's playing catch with them. Uh, there's no ball tracking. So it's kind of a weird problem, but it does give you the opportunity to teach it at least. Yeah, and I guess you're also pushing your own teaching skills and, and, and so forth. You mentioned your long, I don't want to say it that way, maybe, but your long coaching career. Yeah. Um, how did you get into that? And, you know, how, how has your coaching philosophy developed over the years? Yeah, so my own, per uh, the way I got into it is because the pro at the club where I played when I was a junior, I, I really couldn't afford lessons and he kind of knew it. So he gave me an opportunity to work at the club in exchange for lessons. You know, so initially it was just as simple as cleaning the, the courts, sweeping the indoor courts, uh, brushing the clay courts in the summer, cleaning the bathrooms and doing the towels, anything I would do. And I was so excited about actually being able to train um, with actual other kids um, that I did it. And I loved it. And then I got halfway decent at it. By the time I was a senior in high school, he had graduated me from cleaning and all those kind of duties. So like helping out kind of like a little high school assistant coach. Um, I never gave a private. I never took a private. I wasn't that gifted, but I could run my court if someone else was leading the class and uh, I got it going that way. And then um, I kind of taught my way through college. I mean, uh, at where I played college, we had a really good team, but it's actually the coach of the club took all of us boys uh, but that he was like the dominant pro in the area, had all the good players. And we went for him because he got this job at this university, Grand Valley University. And overnight, literally overnight, us six freshmen came in and, and played one through six. Uh, and our team won the state and we went to regionals and won that. We, and the, the dynasty was set to just go crazy. And then the very next year, they canceled the program. Wow. So I decided, you know, I wasn't that good where I can get scholarship college scholarships and I was that school was five minutes literally from my house and I could stay at home so I just didn't play college tennis after my freshman year I stayed there I graduated and I taught a lot I taught a lot of ten. I probably teaching you know my junior or my sophomore year I probably taught 20 hours a week and went to school full-time and then my junior and senior year I was probably teaching 30 hours a week on the court and going through school 
I met my wife, Marty, who you, you probably see her in some of my videos. Met her literally on the tennis court at Grand Valley. She was two years older than me, and I saw this lady hitting, and I asked my buddy, who are those people over there? And then we ended up studying together. So, um, but yeah, I got started coaching basically, you know, in high school. Uh, and my coach, I really was going through um, college thinking I'm not going to be a teaching professional. I didn't, I didn't hate it. I, did, I didn't think it was something I would do. And then almost as fate would have it, um, the pro at my club who happened to be, you know, my, my one coach was long gone. Uh, and then this guy named John Corpy, who was my college doubles partner, he was two, three years older. Um, he was the pro, the teaching pro at my club. And right as literally like almost the same month that I was graduating high school or college, he went from being the, the director of tennis to the manager. So now he needed a, a new director of tennis. And he called me up and he said, hey, how would you like to be the director of tennis? And I'm like, man, I don't know. I never thought about that. And I actually said no in the beginning. Then I told my wife and she says, well, you should have said, yeah. So I called him back and I said, yeah. And then that, so I, I had like a trial by fire. I mean, I was a director of tennis at age 22. I probably, you know, I wasn't really good at that point as a coach. Yeah. And I was kind of immature and I talked like I shouldn't talk to adults and, you know, they, they were probably a little bit horrified, but I had a really good ability to get along with kids and connect and I could run good group drills. Uh, people love coming to my drill groups. So uh, that formula kind of got me going. And the next thing you know, I, I started developing some players and I was lucky. Um, I've coached three different gold ball winners, you know, national champions. Um, and I always say, I don't say that to brag because I really do think it's a lot of it's luck because two of those girls that I coached that were national champions were from the same family and they lived like a mile from my club. So if they had not lived there and had enough money to spend and be at the club and take lessons and travel, then I wouldn't have had any, you know, I wouldn't have had those gals. So um, I think a lot of coaches could probably do that, but just a lot of it's luck. And then as you probably know, if you develop a couple of national ranked juniors and then a third one, and then they win national championships. Next, now everybody's coming, right? The whole area, they all want to go to you because they think you're the next hot shot. And um, I got caught up in that. I mean, I taught a lot of times and I spent an unbelievable amount of hours away from, you know, home and just working. And every weekend was at high performance tournaments. And I liked it. And it was a little bit of an ego thing. But looking back, I'm not sure. Like if my daughter who plays tennis, but she's not a coach. If she decided to be a coach, I would not tell her to do what I did. Uh, I think that was uh, a burnout. I'm glad other people are willing to do it, but to do that right, that high performance role, right? You, know, you need to give up a lot of time and some awkward hours. And you know, it's, I'm glad I did it. It's in my history now. I still, to this day, oddly enough, I get benefit from it. There's people that want, to, want me to coach them because they, they know way back when I used to coach them big players. Um, but yeah, you got to be careful as a coach with all that stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, first, it's you know great, great to be with you today, Jorge, and to uh, to learn a little bit more about um, about your story. Um, one one question that I have, and uh, you know, has a lot to do with you know, how we name the the podcast Tennis IQ Podcast, is is really this concept of Tennis IQ and how how you began to conceptualize it. Yeah, so tennis IQ to me, um, back when I, I mean, I started throwing that phrase around maybe 10 years ago. Um, and I don't even know, I'm, to be honest, I couldn't even tell you if I came up with it. I think I did. Um, but I probably heard some IQ analogy and some other thing. And I go, yeah, tennis IQ. And then I started thinking, I kind of like that phrase. Um, but the background is my P point as a coach was um, I felt like I had a lot of players, a disproportionate amount of players that knew how to strike the ball. They had beautiful strokes, but they just couldn't put it together on, in competition. Okay. So now I have online courses and I'm a bit of an online coach as well. And I know from, because I have a lot of buddies that do that, that the number one complaint, because everybody surveys their list and there's probably been surveys sent to 250,000 tennis players. And, and I know you can say with pretty certainty what your average club player, their biggest pain points is that they don't play as good in a match as they do in practice. So, and I was feeling that. I felt it, A, I felt it as a junior back when I played, and B, I felt it as a coach. I kind of 
would always think like, man, how come Billy or Sam, you know, they, these guys, they just can't put it together. They find a way to lose almost. Uh, and then another thing emerged in my life. I started this tennis drills website. So I started traveling the, a lot, like the whole world to speak. I'm speaking in China. I'm speaking in, um, at Wimbledon. I'm speaking in Australian Open and Norway and Mexico and Canada. And when I travel, which I, I, I like to travel, by the way, um, I, talk, I like to talk to the other coaches from all over the world, right? And it's shocking what I learned. Uh, I'd ask th- things like this. I'd sit with a bunch of Australian coaches. And I'm like, guys, what's, what's happened? How, how do, what happens here? Do you, do you, how do you kids get good? Do they drill? Is there do drill, group drills? Does that exist here? Is it all privates? Is it groups? Is it just leagues? I, I just was curious. And shockingly, it was pretty similar. Yeah, we, you know, our kids do group lessons a couple hours a day and maybe twice a week. And then they do private lessons and then they play some tournaments. And if they're really serious, they might be doing some off court. And the more I talked to coaches from all over the globe, I realized that they also felt like their kids were not putting it together. So I go, oh, well, maybe it's not just me, uh, you know, my inferiority as a coach. It, it turns out if you teach tennis, probably every, pl- every uh, country in the planet has that, that feeling. A lot of coaches are like, yeah, I w- my kids or my students, you know, it's, a, it's just the nature of the sport. It's hard to master. So I started thinking, you know, I, I felt like I had developed, I think I'm pretty good with technique. You know, it's not my passion. I like, I'd rather teach strategy to be honest, but um, I felt like I had developed some, a lot of really technically sound kids. They had these beautiful strokes that would end up betraying them. So I learned quickly. I go, so having beautiful strokes is not, the end. You could be racing to that finish line and running towards the wrong finish line. So I started trying to think like, if I really want to be effective, I have to find a way to get people to actually win tennis matches, like the art of winning, like how the hell do you play the sport? It's not just hitting the ball hard or hitting it in. So I, I, and that was always interesting to me. So I developed this system. So I'll just tell you this tennis IQ system that I've kind of, you know, evolved frankly over the years and I think I've done a pretty good job of packaging it so the way I would explain it to people in the audience when I'm speaking or my student is there's really three levels of tennis IQ so at the most basic level um, it's just all the player can do is just it's about the player and the ball and that's it they're kind of new to the game they're they're basically beginner-ish and that's all you're going to try to put in their mind they're they're not thinking strategies and their side of the court and patterns and stuff it's they're learning. Okay. So most people get through that stage pretty quick. Uh, and then for me, the way I define level like or tennis IQ level two is when you're doing well regarding your side of the court. So everything on my side of the net. So that includes, I understand me. I understand the ball I'm receiving. I understand where it bounces. I understand that if I'm backing up or going forward with my body momentum, I understand if it's an easy strike zone or a tough strike zone. So all these things that I calculate, and I, I put some drills around that to like help people get really good at, at training that. Okay. So, you know, up back stay, the color coding game, the strike zone game, the death coding game. Um, so, and people would get it. Yeah, I get it coach. And then level three of tennis IQ, um, by the way, you can become really good, like 5.0 or higher uh, at level two and, and still not even know much about level three. So for me, level three is that player that they make all the, the good decisions regarding their side of the court. But level three players, they can actually, their focus is on the other side of the court. They are aware of if I'm playing, you know, Josh, and I see, okay, Josh is backing up. Josh has a backhand up high. He's got a one-hander. Or Josh is moving forward. He's getting one right in his torso. Um, so they start thinking about that, okay, and they're playing. So now, to me, that's when you start playing kind of chess instead of checkers. Um, by the way, I, I think the best example I have for that is Rafa. I think Rafa is a level three IQ person because a lot of what he does is disruptive. You know, so if he plays Federer tomorrow, <laughs> he's been doing it for 20 years. Everybody knows what's going to happen. Rafa's going to hit loopy balls, nice and high and top spinny, and try to get Federer to hit strikes or you know backhands up above his shoulder. It's pretty much, I guarantee that that's probably what he would like to to do. And then Federer is going to like, he probably, it's no surprise to him, right? He's thinking, okay, that's probably what Rafa's going to do. So I'm either going to hold my ground for years. He wouldn't, right? 
And then that one magical year at the U at the Australian Open, he just said, "Screw it, I'm not backing up ever, ever again." And he just took everything on the rise and he wins the the thing, and everybody thought he was washed up. So that's how I kind of explain it. And then there's a bunch of drills that go around it. So one of the big lessons I think is a lot of people when they play tennis, I think are are they they kind of play the wrong way. So I do this drill. I'm just going to verbally explain it to you. So. Let's say I'm, I'm hitting with Josh and we're just hitting it back and forth. And we, we start with this drill called um, depth coding. So to understand the depth coding, basically you take the tennis court and you divide it into quarters. So right next to the net is quarter one. We call that zone one. And then later, a little bit deeper and in, still inside the service box is two. Okay. So then you go back behind the service box and that next quarter is three and way deep behind the 60 foot line, if you will, the back half of no man's land, that's four. So if this is the net, this is one, two, three, four, as they get away from me. So if I'm hitting, generally, I want to try to hit to four. I want to hit with depth. You know, I don't want too many balls landing too short. Uh, so I just have players hit back and forth. And this has been probably the most effective thing to have people finally get it. Like, oh, okay, I think I understand what you're saying about this because uh, this is a revealing drill. So I've done this particular exercise literally in a bunch of different continents. And I just tell people, I ask a group of coaches, I say, what do you think? You know, if these are the, the four depth zones, where do you think most balls land? And, you know, it's usually other tennis coaches demonstrating and say, oh, they're going to land mostly in three and four. I say, okay, you know, let's just do it. And then I have the players hit. So, you know, as it hits on my side, I'll say, three, and then I'll hit it back. And when it lands over there, that guy says what it is. So we're just calling it out, okay? just creating awareness. And after about five minutes, it becomes pretty apparent that it's not three and four. It's actually two and three. That's where most balls land. And then I always say, okay, so if you had to narrow it down to just one, what was the most commonly landed in uh, depth zone? And they go three by far. It's never not been three, okay? All right, so fine, the, the most likely place a ground stroke lands is just behind the service line. All right, no problem. And then say, let's move on to drill number two. And I, and I talk about strike zones. So for me, the strike zones are, I, I use four. So above the shoulders, I call that strike zone four. My torso is three. You know, my thigh is two and below my knees is one. Okay, so one, two, three, four. Now, I, I want my players to be able to know, like, you know, where, where do you hit and what, where should you hit? What's your best shot? Like for me, I have a one-hander. So a strike zone four, if I graded that, that's a, a D minus. I hate that shot, okay? A torso, not bad, but a thigh and my backhand, that's like strike zone two. I love that. That's For me, that's perfect. And then one, I have no problem because I can slice well. And then, But everybody should do like a little audit of yourself because it'd be different for Josh and Brian and myself. So we just define what those strike zones are. And then I ask the crowd again. I go, what do you think the most common strike zone is? And they usually say, well, two and three. I say, okay, let's rally and let's just see. And I have the players start calling it out. So as they hit, they'll go four, next one, three. And I just let it go for a while. And then I stop the drill and I say, okay, what, what, what was reality? Yeah, I don't want to tell people. I want them to see it so they know I'm not BSing. <laughs> and they, oh, it was definitely three and four were the two most common. Uh, because that's the way that, you know, unless you're on a sort of weird service or something. Uh, and I said, okay, specifically, which one was it? Well, overwhelmingly, it was three, torso. You know, that's where most balls were. Okay, so now I've, I've led them to discover those two pieces of info. I didn't tell them anything. They just kind of figured it out on their own. And then I give them this analogy, and this is the, the big aha. So I say, let's say, uh, Brian, you're 12 years old, and I'm working with you, right? And you come to me and say, Coach Jorge, I got the big tournament, and I don't know, it's Friday, and I don't feel right. My groundies are, and you start making some manufacturing, some problem, right? And I'm like, oh, crap, I got to go. And I'm going to go speak to this place. But I tell you what, Brian, you're 12. Come on out here. In a sneaky way, if I wanted to kind of get you over your phobia, I would probably set up the ball machine. And if my goal was to get you confident again, to make you play well, I would set that ball machine a certain way, right? I, I wouldn't set it to shoot to skim off the baseline and I wouldn't let it dribble just over the net. I'd probably send it. Remember the goal is how would I set that machine to make Brian play awesome? I'd probably make it bounce in zone, in zone three 
And I'd probably make it cross. I wouldn't make it bounce up high. I make it cross right by your belly, which is zone three. So when you explain that that is the perfect way for someone to kind of groove, and then prior to that, you showed them that that is the way most people play. Now you see the dichotomy. Most people, they had no clue. They just, they're judging a good tennis by how well they're striking the ball and how, if it goes in, if I connected well. And I think that's all horse poop. Uh, the, what really matters, because I could be hitting well and inadvertently be doing the exact same thing that makes you play well. So I always ask people, raise your hand if you think people play good against you. Like, like is that a ripoff? Like, who, who, who always has people play good? Yeah, man, that's me. Everybody plays good. I go, that's, that's you, man. You're, you're like a human ball machine. So this is how I explain it to people. Josh comes out of the ball machine, the tennis factory, and he's set. God gave him some factory settings, and maybe he has a lot of top spin on the forehand, and then maybe he has a lot of slice in the backhand, and he has medium power, and that's Josh. And he, he should know – what those are because those are your your factory settings that you do well and you should try to play with them but if you go to jorge you would say wow his factory settings right out of the factory are a little bit different he kind of has a different settings you know and brian has different ones yet so just like a ball machine is fairly worthless if it just has one speed and one location i look at people i try to teach them to look at yourself as a human ball machine the more gadgets those really good ball machines they'll have a whole bunch of panel right they'll have left right high low fast high a lot of revolutions not revolutions and they can do it all and that's what i would hope for to inspire for my my players so when i when i talk to that 30 the umbrella is the tennis iq uh, and then the reality is like you got to be careful because you might be playing the wrong way like most people do now at least if i can get to them i kind of go man another dude might have something here because this is i i do 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 this a lot these are my problems now we can start with the conversation. And that that's like the funnest coaching I do. That's, I love that kind of stuff. Well, I think the thing I like about that model, Jorge, is it, um, it realizes or it's very specific about realizing that tennis is a combat sport. You are in a fight. Yet, because, uh, you know, the consequences of winning and losing in tennis are a little less physically dire than, say, boxing or wrestling, you, we sometimes lose that focus that it's about the opponent. And, um, you know, when I first was introduced to your model, it made me think about uh, a, a book that I actually think all tennis players should read. And it's called The Fighter's Mind by Sam Sheridan. It has nothing to do with tennis, but it's all about the mental game of different fighting sports. And, um, Two of the, I think, the key chapters in that book are by wrestlers. You may even know who both of these guys are. So Dan Gable, not only a great wrestler, but a fantastic coach at, at Iowa for many years. And then Randy Couture, who was probably better known for some of his physical training things in his MMA career, but he was a wrestler at Oklahoma State. And there was one common thing in the chapters on the two of those guys. And it was that the point of competition, at least in fighting, is to break your opponent mentally. And I remember reading that. I was like, wow, that's, I get that. And, I, and then I would think about some matches that I've played. I'm like, all right, I, I've actually done that. I wasn't trying to, but I can remember that that happened. And then it occurred to me, well, I'm going to try to do this intentionally. And then when I was able to do it intentionally, I think I was forever changed, but that to me is what level three is about. It's right. about making your opponent uncomfortable because if you're, let's say, I don't like zone four, what's going to happen to me over, over the course of a match? I'm going to become more frustrated. I'm probably going to start acting out. I'm not hitting it in my optimal contact zone anymore. Um, I think, you know, you can also be moving players, you know, with wise too, right? Can start to divorce the racket a little bit more from the body, and that can be a a, a, a point of un, uncomfortableness right there. Sure. So I started talking about your level three of tennis IQ, along with sort of what I've been calling sort of your competitive IQ, getting that this is a fight, and combining the two, and that's why you need level three, is so that you know exactly how to make people uncomfortable, 
and know that that will play out over the course of a match. Not everybody will break down, but many players, and especially club players, will absolutely right. break down at a certain level. That, that's uh, exactly true. And I think, you know, I use this phrase called sabotage, which is just my words for, you know, I, I always, it, so many, so many of these things that I coach now, it's just from my own screw ups as a player <laughs> that I did back then. But um, so obviously if I play, I'm hoping I'm winning. So if this is Jorge and I'm playing at this level and you're playing at this level, you know, things are good. But on those days where this is my opponent and I'm here, you know, I'm down one four or whatever, um, that happens a lot, right? Uh, where you're not in the lead. Well, the only th- idea that most players have when they're like this, I'm the low guy. The only thing that occurs to them is I got to raise my level, man. Uh, I'm down one four. I got to try to raise my level. Um, and that's not easy to do. If it was, you would have probably already done it. Right. So it's not like, Oh, I'm, I'm going to try 70%, but if I need to, I'll, I'll try hundred percent. So you're probably already trying it as much as you can, or as physically as hard as you can. Um, so the way most people do that, I found, is they try to go for more winners, okay? And most people are good enough to, when they do that, they'll, they'll make an, a few more winners, but along with it comes equally as many errors. So they just, they sputter. They, they can't just like raise their level. So the other option is to make this guy come down. Okay, so you do that with sabotage. You, you make sure that your bomb machine settings aren't set to make the guy groove, but they're set to be disruptive, that you're, you're, targeting weak sides or you're doing things that it's not about you, dude, this you're the second most important person on the court. The most important person is the guy over there. And my job is to mess with them, frankly. Okay. So um, now I've been the victim of losing to people with sabotage all the time. When I was a junior, I would play a pusher, you know, you hear the classic and and I didn't even invent sabotage. I mean, I'd like to claim that I did, but the, the, the couple few things that are notoriously effective is slicing, drop shots, moon balls. I mean, if you just have those three, you've got a pretty full quiver of, of sabotage tools. Uh, and then if you can deploy them at will, now tennis is fun because you go, because all I really need to do is, is be close to the guy. If he's stomping on my face and he's up here and I'm here, uh, I'm not going to win. But if I can just make it here so the match is 3-3, three, 4-4, three, four, four, now the scoreboard pressure might get to the guy, uh, and that might help me. But there's not going to be scoreboard pressure on the guy when he's up 5-1, and you know I'm sitting over there kicking my racket around the court. So um, I think sabotage is important. We actually have a day at my club. Uh, I run this big tennis academy at Hope College. And on Wednesday morning, we have sabotage. And I, t- I tell the kids it's actually a dangerous day because we say, look, just the morning for about two hours, we're going to – and I, I tell them, I, as, long, as far as I know, we are the only club in America that I know that is actually actively teaching sabotage skills as part of the program. And just be forewarned, students, that some of you are going to hate this. Um, and then what will happen is, you know, I make them slice. And we'll play games where you can only slice or loop. And we'll play another game where you have to hit drop shots on every thing that lands short. And other games where you have to, you know, sneak attack and all these different sabotage things. And um, a lot of people don't do it well, so they don't want to add it. I'm like, hey, hear me out. I'm not saying you're becoming this. I just want it in your arsenal. So you play aggressive baseliner like you always have been, but it'd be nice to have this if you're behind. And overwhelmingly, what happens is people play poorly, and they complain all morning long. <laughs> and, like, this kind of makes my point. All these things we're having you do make the other guy play crappy. You're doing it to each other. So it's kind of proof. And it works, but sometimes a teenage mind, you know, they don't want to hear it. They just like, I don't know, it sucks. And I don't want to do that. It's not real tennis uh, until it happens to them. Then they're like, man, you know, so I think it's fascinating. I love, um, I love kind of getting at that level where we're kind of playing ch- chess and, and, and not gamesmanship, but true, the art of comp- competition, the art of like strategy and doing, you know, getting off of your own drama about, I want to hit well. And you know, that's the immature tennis mind. I want to hit hard. I want it to go in. I want to hit well. I want my endorphins in my bloodstream. Why, why, why? I, I want a million dollars. Who, who gives a crap? Uh, it doesn't matter. You're in a combative sport uh, and, and your job 
part is to win. And a, lot, a big part of that, the easier parts to do in that is to sabotage. So if they get it, but I tell you this, here's the lining. Um, if someone, if I can get a junior, even for once in his life to turn a match around because he used sabotage, they get addicted pretty damn quick. Like, Ooh, that was fun. You know? So for us, the only time that really happens is doing supervised match play. So we'll be playing, you know, so these are sets, but they're not a tournament. So nothing on your permanent record, but it allows us to say, Hey, listen, you know, that guy likes this. Why don't you try doing this for the next two games? Try this. And then they see like, wow, that actually worked. I won those two games. I'm like, mm. you know, so you're kind of, I call it a brain transplant. You kind of think for them initially. Uh, and because they just, I, I couldn't have thought all those things out when I was a, you know, 17, 18, I was as dumb as a rock. You know, I just hit hard and I would walk off the court to be honest. If I hit really hard and I, I lose, but I felt like I hit well, I'd be somewhat happy. I, I mean, I didn't like losing, but that was my measure. I was aiming at the wrong definition. My definition was, well, I hit good. And I'm like, no, nah, I don't care how you hit. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, hitting well, quote unquote, good might be just the exact opposite thing uh, you need to be doing because uh, the other guy might love it. Yeah. What's funny as you were talking there, there, there were a couple things that you said that, rem- you know, Josh and I recently had a, a uh, conversation with Bill Tim, um, yeah. you know, and, and a lot of your sabotage concepts are very uh, much in his winner's creed about how to, you know, change a losing strategy. And, and, you, and a lot of the things he suggests there are all, all sabotage techniques. And he also uses the same uh, analogy of, uh, you know, chess versus checkers uh, in our conversation. So that's, that's, that's really good stuff. Um, and I like, uh, thank you for telling us a little bit more about how you're training that. I like the observation stuff. That's some things that I do with some of the, the kids that I work with when I do some on-court training is, uh, cause I've also, and Josh has done this too. We've both been college coaches. Um, and I think that's actually a really valuable way of, like you said, a brain transplant, getting them to think different things, whether even you know, I, I might focus sometimes just on on their in between point routine and getting them to follow that when they might not normally do right. do something like that. Um, I think that. The, uh, oh, go ahead, please. Uh, that brain transplant thing is just the name I gave it, but I used to. There's a guy I work with now. Uh, his name is Adam. Uh, he played Division One tennis. Good, good player. And uh, when I coached him, he was probably the last kid I coached privately before I kind of started managing and stuff. And um, I was doing a semi-private with him and his buddy. They both were really excellent players. And um, they also played doubles part, uh, doubles together. And we would go an hour and a half, hour, uh, basically a semi-private. And the first, you know, basically 30 minutes were dedicated to Adam's project. So, you know, he's working on these three or four things at this time. So we would work mostly with him and Mike would just be a spar. Then the next 30 minutes, we do the opposite. Okay, now, Mike, we're working on your thing, and he's working on chipping and charging or whatever it is. And Adam was just a spar for that. And then the last half hour, we always would play a brain transplant, which is now they play each other. Then I park myself behind Adam, like Adam's serving. And I would say, okay, your body, my brain. So I'm going to tell you before each point what we're going to do. All right. So I would say stuff like, okay, I want to fast serve right at his forehand, fast, because I think he's going to overswing and he'll be late. Okay, so that's what I want you to try. Ready, go. And he'll do it, and it may or may not happen. But And then, okay, good job. All right, he hit a win or whatever. Okay, next point. Let's do this. Let's go slider. Let's go just a slider out wide to his backhand, and then I want you to make sure that your next shot is a forehand, and uh, then build a point from there. Boom. So just doing that exercise um, for almost every junior I coached was like, because I'd always followed up with this. I'd say, okay, so what do you think? Well, yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, so how much thinking, like you saw what I, like this would be how I play. It's just, I'm, I would, I'd just be telling myself, right? So I'm thinking on their behalf and I'm letting them do their body. Sometimes I say serve volley and I can't survive. Well, serve volley anyway and just try it. <laughs> um, so the takeaway 99 times out of 100 is like, wow, I, I don't plan like that or think that much at all. I'm not even a 10th of that. I said, okay, so that's why we do it. Okay. So now you know that if you're really playing high level tennis, 
it's a thinking game. You got to be doing this. And then with the other half of that, the first half of that segment uh, is all my thoughts. And the second half is all his thoughts. So I say, okay, three games are in now. Uh, I'm going to shut up. And now before every first and second serve, you got to turn around to me. I'm at the back curtain. Okay, Jorge, I'm going to serve a kick serve here and I'm going to serve volley or I'm going to do this and that. Sometimes about every fifth point, I would say, okay, why are you going to do that? Um, and often they, uh, I don't know, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm changing things. So they're just putting out, they're playing blackjack and they're not even paying attention to what cards they're putting out. You know, so, all right, so let me tell you what I would do, okay? Uh, it's add out, okay? So I would make damn sure you make a first serve. I don't want to be hitting second serves when it's break point, I mean, personally. All right, so I don't want you to hit soft, but a lot of RPMs. And since you're going to be not hitting a boomer, uh, let's keep it to his backhand because he's less likely to jump on it and, and rip it down our throat. Um, and just, oh, yeah, I never thought, you know. So if they just experience that level of thinking, um, a lot of times they can then take it from there. It's their first taste. I always wished, I don't know, maybe someday they'll figure out how to do this, but if if – they could have like some mechanism, maybe a magic hat that the pros wear where you could hear what they say. I mean, how epic would it be to hear Roger Federer's thought process? You know, his voice is going on. You know, there's a voice in there. I don't know what the hell is saying. I'm thinking he's probably planning a lot. I don't think it's like, come on, Roger, move your feet, you big loser. I don't think that's what he says. Uh, but I would pay major dollars to hear the inner voice. I, we got to come up with some. Pretty soon they'll have that where they can read your thoughts. Right? It comes out on the screen like, oh, wow, he's going to serve out. Wow. He's just fired up. With, you know, uh, That would be so cool. Uh, but I don't think because we don't hear that, I think your average tennis player doesn't even know it, it, that it happens. So that, that brain transplant thing, as corny as it is, uh, is probably one of my more effective coaching tools uh, to get people to really get it, um, to really learn how to play the actual sport. Yeah, well, that's I, I really like that that concept as well of um, helping players to to see all the the options that are out there and that that planning piece from somebody like you who's who's been through it, who's worked with you know a number of players and, and help them to see that rather than just going up to the line and hitting a serve, that there's so much more that can really go into it. Um, a question that I have is I know that you're very involved in the um, education side of tennis, both through um, USPTA and PTR, where you're a, a master professional, um, as well as um, being a, a, a mental toughness specialist through the Human Performance Institute with, with uh, Dr. Jim Lear. Um, so I, my, how, how does that, that training that you have um, fit into your coaching and broadly your, your coaching philosophy? Well, yeah, I think one of the things, you know, I was classic. Um, I always say to people that I train or that I speak to that when you're a tennis player, you basically, you train four areas. You know, I don't invent these or just, they are, you know, there's a technique side. There's a lot of that. That's one silo, all your technical issues. Movement is a whole silo by itself. Uh, mental toughness is a whole silo by itself. And then um, strategy is a whole silo by itself, right? So you, some people are really good with, you know, one or the other, that's fairly common. What most people do, most rec players, especially in juniors, I believe as well, is if you look at what those four silos, they're training in the technique, um, like exclusively. Uh, I think there's a real addiction to, to technical, you know, perfection. Um, I, I really wish that my industry had not evolved into a lesson taking industry as much as a tennis playing industry, but it has, you know, and I'm not against lessons. I mean, I make a living teaching lessons and I think there's a place for that. But nowadays, you know, if you look at your average high school player that at, at goes to my club or any club, they're, they're spending six hours a week on the court and six out of six are not match play. It's drilling and hitting and, you know, sparring, but dude, where's the scoreboard? Where are you going to test? You know, so they don't, you know, I, I always tell people there's the real purpose of competition is feedback. That, that's all it is. Um, now, I did, I suffer from this because uh, for me, when I played, competition was to prove, you know, uh, it's for results and it's how I measure myself. It's really 
your process in tennis is a never ending journey of adding more and more tactics that you can actually use and deploy uh, so that by the, you know, each year you're a little bit better and your toolbox is bigger and you can do more things. That's basically your job description of a tennis player. Um, but if, if you don't, um, you know, ever take a quiz, which is like what I call a match, just like a quiz, you'll never know. Oh, wow. Um, my serve actually sucks. I thought it was great and it doesn't. So I, I work at a college, right? So I always use this analogy of a college class. If I walked into a class and the professor said, listen, you guys are all, you know, young adults now. You're not, I'm not going to babysit you. So come to class. Here's what my requirements are. I want you to come to class, but I don't believe in quizzes. Uh, I'm the professor. I'm not going to quiz you. I'm not going to give you a test. All I want you to do is show up every day and then we'll have a final exam on the last day of class. Well, I would probably as a student would have thought that was a great idea because I'd be like, oh, cool. No quizzes or I love it. But here's the danger in that with that analogy. So I don't take the quizzes. I don't take the tests. I show up on exam day and he hands me the exam and I kind of look at it and I say, okay, first question. And I realize hmm, I don't know that answer. <laughs> All right, so then I go to the second one. I go, oh, I don't know this one either. And by the time I realize I don't know the third, it's only then that I'm real. Okay, I'm flunking this thing. I actually needed those quizzes and those tests to tell me that I sucked at this class, so I could have freaking done something about it. So that's what matches is. And juniors in particular in our country are adverse to competition. They're like professional lesson takers. Um, and the classic is that they, they train with me all year long at, in the club. You know, 25 years ago, everybody that came to my club in the junior program, they aspired to college and they aspired a national USA ranking. That's what everybody wanted. Now it's 99%. I want to make varsity tennis. And that's who pays the bills at my club. I love that group. That's my <laughs> customer. Um, and the problem is they will train, you know, um, all year long, they take two drills. I'm going to take a third drill this year. I'm going to take a private lesson with Coach Adam, and I'm going to do this, this, and this. And when you look real close at their workout regimen, there's no match play. So they go to high school tryouts, which, by the way, in Michigan were two weeks ago, and a percentage of them fail. They're like, oh, my God, you know, I totally choked, Coach. And they're crying, and they're freaking out. I go, what happened? I played like crap. I double faulted. I was so nervous. I go, so this is what I was telling you about. You, you needed to play all those tournaments and practice sets to, to figure out. It's too late. You're, you're figuring out, you know, 20 minutes later, your coach is cutting you. Uh, and you didn't make varsity again this year. Sorry, you're a junior now. And it's mortifying for these kids. So that, that lack of competition is a real problem, I think, with young American players. Yeah, I think it's uh, this is something you know. You're preaching to the choir on that, Jorge. Uh, we, we've talked about this with some of our past guests, and I think there's there's not enough of a realization that competing in itself is a skill. So that's one of the and but it feels like sometimes as the tennis teaching profession, it's like we are teaching for the wrong test. We're teaching for a skills test, as if like there's this the NHL skills competition. Um, but that's not how you, you know, you make your varsity team. That's not how you make your college team or get into the hall of fame. You actually have to know how to win matches. It's not about hitting cones or, you know, I can hit my cross court forehand all day, all right. you know? And, uh, I, I think that there has to be more of a realization of that, but, um, yeah, the industry, I think they have to get as many kids on the court as possible to make, um, you know, ends meet financially. And I get that, but, um, I think the, the more that we get people competing, the more used to it they'll become. I recall hearing Brad Gilbert doing a talk at Google in which he said he played a ton of matches before he was 10. Mm. And you can, you know, he's a great example of somebody who perhaps his physical game and skills were not, you know, he's probably a really good level three tennis IQ player. Right. Um, you know, got to four in the world with not the greatest looking game aesthetically but he had played so many matches that he got that dynamic. Right. And I think we're all in agreement that that's something that's missing. That's classic. And that's, that's the rare person. You know, I always kind of tell my fellow coaches, um, I, I have this three question thing that I kind of label players and I'll say for the strokes that, you know, let's say the player, Sam, 
So for the strokes that Sam has, he wins more matches than he should, or he wins about as many matches as he should, or he wins fewer matches than he should. Well, I love asking that question. I'll ask that to a group of people. And sadly, when I say, raise your hand, just be honest, there's no right or wrong answer. For the strokes that you currently have, you win more matches than you technically should. And literally like nobody's hand goes up. Okay. That's a rare person. You know, that would be Brad Gilbert, right? Would have raised his hand on that one. Uh, and then I say, okay, no problem. For the strokes you have, you win about as much as you should. And about 30% of the hands go up. Uh, and then how many resonate with this? For the strokes you have, you're not winning as much as you should. And like 70% of the hands go up. So it kind of tells you the mindset of the average person walking around the planet that play, plays tennis is they're back to that one thing. I don't, something's wrong with me. I don't know what the heck my problem is. I don't win like I should. I don't know if I'm a choker. I don't know what it is, but I can't get it together. And um, it's really frustrating when you're experiencing that, but it's also kind of cool if you can learn how to coach it and, and break through. Uh, it's really fun, but it's, it's, it's reality. It's a, it's a harsh reality. Yeah. For sure. A lot of people are stuck in that scenario. I want to ask you about one one more concept. Um, so a, a few years ago, I was, uh, I was working on court with one of my mental toughness students. And she said, hey, I just watched this great video, and I know what the word win means now. I know what that acronym uh, is. <laughs> can, yeah. you, can you explain that, Jorge? Yeah. So actually, the, it's the win method, W-I-N. And it was a, it's a mental toughness kind of habit. Uh, and to be honest with you, I, I learned it from one of the college kids that went to Cope. I, my daughter played college tennis and I work at a college. I don't coach the teams, but for two years, I was the assistant coach when my daughter played. And one of our other players, a really good one, Nash, her name is Nancy. She said, uh, we were having a discussion on mental toughness and she said, yeah, my coach uses this win thing. And I'm like, boom, I'm stealing it. I like it. <laughs> um, so win is basically a method where in the middle of competition, uh, as soon as the point ends, rather than think about the future, the past, whatever, you automatically get in the habit of asking yourself, W-I-N, what's important now? Now. Okay? Not in the back then, not in the future, what's important now? Uh, and that seems to, people get it. It's a nice little acronym and they kind of like it. Uh, when I can get, and I'll try, you know, this is the exercise I'll do. I'll say, the way I usually do it is we'll play out points. And as soon as, um, you know, for the first two or three minutes, the point is done. And I say, hey, Ryan, what's important now? Tell me what's important now. And I get you to verbalize something. And by the way, you can't say, sir, you have to reply, what's important now is blah, 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 blah. And that's like pulling teeth because a lot of times, here's how it usually goes. Okay, Brian, what's important now? Uh, I don't know. Okay, that, okay. No, think about it. Uh, that I don't suck. No, I mean that. All right, come on, look, you know, they're really, so you have to kind of like force it out of them for a while, but after a while, let me tell you how I would do it. Okay, what's important now is that I get my first serve in because, you know, I'm down a point. Or what's important now is that I play a long point because the guy looks like he's ready to keel over. Or, and then you start giving examples and then it's like, oh, okay, I, I get it. And then they can take it from there. But it's a great little tool. Uh, I've had my daughter on the throat of her racket. I'd have her write that once in a while. W-I-N, what's important now, so that <laughs> when she's out there, I don't want her looking over to the sidelines or having poor eye control all the time. She could just stay right there near her strings. What's important now, and kind of get in that habit. And that, that's what that means. I, I love that one. So it's, it's a good one. Yeah, it is a good one because it just keeps you in present focus, right. which is, is so important in tennis. And I also yeah. think you, you're asking that question. That's also helping sort of factor into raising players' tennis IQ and their – ability right. to recognize what's going on and, and formulate strategies, et cetera. You know, you're just building more, much more self-awareness of what's happening out there. On yeah. The court. Yeah. Speaking well, I didn't say this earlier, but regarding another way I kind of teach this tennis IQ stuff is um, it's really about acquiring more usable tactics, deployable tactics. Okay. So let's, what's a tactic? Maybe a tactic is that you, moon ball somebody or you loop the ball you try to push them back towards the fence okay um that's a tactic maybe you know josh has it where yeah i have it but i can't i can only do it in practice and brian says i can do it in practice and i can do it in a match but i don't like to 
And I might be, ah, I like to do it. I can do it in magic. I can do it in practice. And I actually enjoy doing it. So the different levels, they rise to different levels. Um, but those, I call those missions. Um, and trying to get people to play mission-based instead of point-based. So um, a lot of times I would, if I was working with you two guys and I'm coaching you, I would say, all right, we're going to play out points, guys, and here's what I want to do. And I go over to Brian and I would say, Brian, just for you, for the next 10 minutes, uh, I want you to see if you can jo make Josh back up into zone six, which is way, get his body way back, back by the back fence. Okay. I don't care how you do it, but that's your goal. And every time you accomplish it, take a mental note that you did it. And then you did it again. You did it third time, you did it fourth time. And that's what you're keeping score of. I want you to tell me in 10 minutes from now, how many times you did it. Uh, and then I may, without telling Josh what it was, right. Then I go over to Josh and say, Josh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to direct three out of four balls to Brian's backhand or whatever. Okay. Uh, and every time you do that, you, boom, you keep scoring in your head and, and the ball goes out of play. Okay. We're not even counting points. One, we're counting missions accomplished. Um, and that seems to do two things. It takes a little pressure off, but it starts to get players to get serious about, okay, yeah, I need to have that. Um, I know that your factory setting is to whale the hell out of it and make it go, you know, right past the guy's waist at the baseline. But that's fine. But let me see if you can do this. Uh, every time you get a ball that lands short inside the service box, you hit a drop shot. Or every time you back them up to zone six, you sneak in. So you can, I, you know, you can come up with dozens and dozens of those. And that's how you practice it. And then you start saying to Brian, okay, Brian, you have like 12 usable things. And Josh, you have four. And usually Josh is like, well, this is kind of bull crap. I, I don't want to have four. I want to. All right, well, which ones do you want to get after? You don't have to – let's focus on two or three at a time. You're not going to do all ten and, and try to get, get them to go up one iota, you know, per week. Let's, let's get after – you know what would be really good for you? A chip and charge. I love it. Based on your game, I think a week I can serve, you should add a chip and charge. Currently not your game, but let's see if we can do that. All right, and then you go after it. Okay, it's probably going to take a week or two, maybe three, before you feel like I can maybe deploy that in a match. Uh, but this is the job of tennis coach and the job of tennis player. You use more and more and more of those. Okay. Fed, Rafa, they can do all that. They certainly have things to do better than others. But if, if you said to Fed, hey, I need you to serve volley, done. I need you to play, play a long point, done. I need you to slice the ball, and keep it low, done. I need you to uh, chip and charge, done. I need you to play a steady point, just play a long point, done. I need you to start using more angles, done. They just do it all. Okay. Um, you don't have to do it all. That's the, the great thing. But you can't just do one. If you go to war and your toolbox has one tool, it's going to be a long day if that tool ain't working. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, I don't know if you'd agree, but it seems like a lot of uh, women's tennis and junior girls tennis is a little bit one-dimensional. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's true. I coach all three of those girls I coached that were national champions. They all they're all female, and um, one of them in particular was infamous. I mean, she won the girls fourteen nationals by being a retriever. She she just got a lot, a lot of balls back. Luckily, me, her family, everybody in her life was telling her this ain't gonna work in the sixteens, uh, and it's certainly not gonna work in the eighteens. Right? We call her the golden retriever because she could <laughs> freakishly good defense and very fast. Amazing lob. And if you want to hit 200 balls, that's, I'm fine with that. And she could outlast anybody. Um, super tough to, and as people got, you know, to be 16, they can attack and stuff. Uh, she could still defend most of that. But then, you know, when you get top 10 in the country um, and you're good at attacking now because you're, you know, you're 18 and you're not 15 and your overhead's not, you know, shanking half the time and you're putting them all away. That's when she that's when she had her nightmare. But she did do well, to be honest. She she added a whole bunch of different things to her game to keep that from happening all the time. But if she, if she would have just held on to, I'm winning now, and what the heck? I mean, I've got a freaking gold ball over there. What's your problem? Um, but I think that's super important. So what I what I like about what, what you're saying and about um... – you know, helping, helping players to play in different ways. And, you know, maybe a player that generally grinds from behind the baseline, you, you have them chip and charge and serve and volley or vice versa. The player that, um, you know, plays really aggressive and have them slice and dice and play with more finesse. 
Um, but really what you're giving players is options. And those options come in handy based on you know, whatever type of player you might, you might face. And it, it gives you more, more tools in the toolkit, especially as you said, as you play better players in the 16s and 18s, getting on to you know, college tennis as well as higher levels of the game. Uh, my, my question is, how can, um, as tennis instructors um, and, and sports psychology professionals, how can we help um, young athletes to, to gain that larger perspective of the type of player that they'll need to be a little bit later as, you know, that type of player that they want to be when they're 17, 18 or in college when they're younger and to understand that, you know, the, the way, the way forward is not just by never missing a ball and lobbing all the time and only having that, but to really have every piece of the game. Yeah, that's a great question. I actually had a, a, a perfect, I have a, a pretty good answer for you. So back in the day when I was coaching a lot and I had tons of private lessons, um, I didn't frankly share a lot of what I thought was working for me. Uh, that was my competitive advantage. That was my secret sauce. Now I'm quite the opposite. I got websites. I got 2000 drills out there and I got every concept on my free website, you know, um, on YouTube. But to answer that question, I think what happens, or what happened for me was I had this document and I called it skills by age division. Okay. So when I took someone on, if they were 10, 13, 16, whatever, I'd have this thing. So the way this document works is, I, I, I measured five things. I measured serve, return, baseline play, net play, and passing shots and lobs. Because if you think about it, those are the five play situations. I did not invent them, but you don't do anything except those things. You never ever think about that for a second. On a tennis court, you're doing one of those five things always and nothing ever. You're either serving, you're returning, you're playing from the baseline, you're transitioning to the net or at the net, or you're hitting passing shots and lobs. That's it. All right. So to me, that makes sense. If that's tennis, that's how tennis is played. Those are the big five things you do. Then I can just build my whole teaching system around that and say, how is Brian serve? And then how is his return? And, and we work with projects. So what I would do is I'd say um, for 10 and under, it might be this. On the serve for 10 and under, um, remember, these are newish players. I just want them to be able to, to not double fall and to direct it left or right. Boom, that's it. Um, and then for baseline, I want them to be able to keep the ball deep and be a wall. And for net play, I just want them to be able to make volleys. I don't care if the form is even really good yet. Uh, and for passing shots of lobs, I want them to be able to lob ruthlessly and preferably over the backhand shoulder. Um, and for, you know, so that would be that. But then as I go to 12s, I raise the bar. Now the 10 serve was just getting in left to right. Now the 12 serve is like, I isolate that weakness on that guy. And then if 14, sir, we add some more. So we kind of raise the bar. So that, that blueprint, if you will, based on those five play situations, then what, that was my preference. You know, I don't, I'm not saying it's even right. That's what I wanted them to accomplish by each age division. Because look, when you're 14 and, and I have this down for your serve, you got to get this done in the 14th because in the 16th, we got some more things we got to do in your serve. We can't be here at what, 18 years old and go, you don't have directional control yet. You don't have height changing. You don't have speed change. We're way the hell behind. You know, now it's too late. So that, um, and I would show that. I Sometimes I show that to a 10-year-old and his family. Here's what I'm going to be working on. This is what I want your server to look like now because you're, you're nine years old. This is the bracket we're looking at. This is what I want. This is what I want. And it would help me stay on point as a coach. Uh, and then 12, we're going to be doing this. Sometimes I take my 10-year-old and about at least once a year, I'd have like a family you know, report card thing, kind of like parent teacher. And I would say, okay, here's the vision sheet. Here's what we've been working on. Here's where we're at. We're a little bit ahead on this. We're a little behind on that. He's going to play 14s now. Uh, this is the next thing we're going to be able to serve. We're now going to be trying to do these two things that are new. You know, I didn't think about heights now. Now I'm actually going to want him to start moving the ball up the strike zones on people. Um, and I, the sad thing is, that was super, super helpful to me. I mean, I think that was the reason I was able to develop some pretty good players. Um, and as I, you know, I go and I do some club consulting now and I do, do a lot of coach development. And when I talk about that, most people are like, whoa, that's a great idea. No, no one's doing it. Most private lessons, sadly, in our country are band-aids. 
hey, Jimmy, even if I have Jimmy every Tuesday at six o'clock for the whole school year, um, Jimmy, what do you want to work on? I don't know. What do you, uh, well, then you play a tournament. Yeah. How'd it go? I'm um, like, a double fault. Okay. Let's do a serve lesson. And then maybe that one hour is a good serve lesson. Let's assume it is, but there's, there's no roadmap. You're not, the way that should go is, all right, Jimmy, come on back. You had a tournament, right? Okay. Tell me how it went. All right. Let's look at our list. We're back on all these things. Every day we're doing some of these things. You know, we're working on all five areas because you're going to be well-rounded. I'm not going to disregard and not teach you net. I'm not going to make you a net player if you if it's dumb for you to, like, I wouldn't have, you know, forced Andre Agassi to, like, hey, man, you got to start learning more net. But I want him to at least be adequate so it's not a weakness and it can't be exposed. And then that's it. But for baseline, if, hey, this is your specialty area, man. We're going to kick ass here. We're going to do this, this, and this. And take it even further. So it's really customized, and I don't think it really happens that much. And unfortunately, I think there's a lot of band-aid privates. Yeah, I'd agree. I think uh, development plans are are the exception, and certainly not the rule. Um, and I like your use of vision. That's something that I work on with with my students is helping them to find, you know, working with them in partnership. Who do they want to be as well? Especially from a mental, emotional, character part of who they are. I think that's uh, that's a really important aspect. So I imagine, Jorge, as you're working on those five areas, that you're including tennis IQ and sabotage all within that, so that that's part of the scorecard. Yeah, for sure. Particularly because those are all kind of technical areas. You can look at those. You know, those I, they're really the five play situations is what I refer to them as. Um, but serving is one. Serving you can do. You know, I could choose to just be totally technical with it. Or I could go past that and start working with uh, tactical, or I could start doing IQ things like, hey, you know, when you serve and it goes into the guy's waist every single time, he loves it at his waist. I mean, what's going on here? Your purpose is like you're his best buddy. You're making him play good. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, there, that whole level of thing, you know, I, I had a quote. This is one of the, my best lines ever, I think. I was working with this kid. This is my old club. So it's like oof, 20 years ago. Good player. I, like, he ended up being D1 player. And he, I, I kind of yelled out at him in a, in a private lesson. I go, you're going to get arrested for attempted murder of tennis strategy. You like literally do like, you like the anti-strategy. You like pick the, you, you couldn't do more things wrong. Every shot that you should be hitting hard, you hit soft. You should be hitting soft. You, it's like, dude, you can, you're not even making 2% of your decisions right. You, you go cross court, you should go down lane. And I kind of yelled it, but it's actually kind of true. A lot of people are, they have an assault on tennis strategy. They, they don't even, they're murderers of it. Yeah. <laughs> that is a good quote. Um, so Jorge, let's maybe just, we'll wrap up here. So um, tell us uh, where people can find you on on the web and uh, sure. social media, so, et cetera. Yeah. So I do have a Facebook group, but probably the easiest uh, thing to do is I have really two, two web presences. One is for coaches. I have a tennis drills website. It's got 2000 tennis drills and coaches from 65 countries uh, subscribe to it. It does cost money because um, I got employees and a lot of <laughs> work to be done. Uh, and then I have JorgeCapistani.com, which is my, I call that my player's website. But to make it easy, rather than remember both URLs, I just have one URL I send people to. And it's CapistaniTennis.com. So if you just go to CapistaniTennis.com, uh, there you will see bo a box that says player's website for coaches and another one player's website. So you can go to either one. That's the one that way you don't have to try to do them both. And a lot of times people like to visit them both. Um, but that's the thing. And then also on Facebook, I'm, you know, I think I, I've been stuck at 5,000 friends forever, so you can't really go more there. But I have a, a group on Facebook called Tennis Drills TV, um, and I put a lot of drills and training videos up there. Uh, but those are the places you'll find me. Uh, CapistaniTennis.com is probably the easiest one. Uh, if nothing else, they should check out the free website for players because it has a free mental toughness course on there uh, that they can get in. It's four different things. We cover fear of losing. Um, the inability to close someone out, um, your inner voice and how you can get negative and choking and nerves. Uh, and there is probably over 12,000 people have gotten that course. It's a free course. I just send it to them. 
you know, via email, they get the first video two days later, the second, two days later, third, two days later, the fourth. And I love getting comments about that because it's right. You know, so many people struggle with that. That's what I know. That's why I made it. You know, I could have done a, a surf course or whatever, but my free course is on mental toughness. Um, yeah, and I think uh, you also get a free download of your ebook. Yeah, yeah, it's a, mental toughness. It's, yeah, it's like seventy pages, a little workbook. It's kind of like you read a chapter, then you fill out some things. Like it's a cool little book. Yeah, it is. It does. It builds some good self awareness. There's really good questions in there for players to reflect on. I think that that's uh, valuable. So we'll make sure we get all that stuff into our uh, show notes and show description, so that people know exactly yeah. where to where to find that stuff. So. Um, Jorge, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm glad you guys reached out to me. I love talking tennis IQ and just tennis. So I appreciate what you guys are doing to help people get educated and learn how to play a little better. And it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Jorge. This is great. Well, Josh, that was a great conversation. And I'm just curious, what, what stood out for you from that? So, so two big things. Um, number one, this concept of sabotage that... Um, he said he thinks he's uh, one of the only, his academy is one of the only academies where they really intentionally train sabotage. Um, and I know this is something we've talked about before in the podcast, but when you can make yourself, uh, make yourself play in a way where you make your opponent feel uncomfortable, then that's, that's really half the battle right there. Rather than um, just focusing on your own game, thinking about what you can do to make your opponent's life and your opponent stay on court as tough as possible. So that, that concept of sabotage was, was really um, a, a, big, a big takeaway that I had. And also that he has players um, really from a young age trying to play in different ways. And sometimes he'll be behind the court talking to a player saying, you have to you know, serve and volley here or um, you know, loop the ball with heavy topspin or use the slice, try to bring somebody to the net. But giving players the toolkit of all the different shots, all the different styles so that when they're in the situation where they need to adjust and they need to play a certain way against a certain type of player, they have that style in their toolkit. It's like he's giving people, um, junior players, as many different tools as possible that they can use in their toolkit. So whenever they need that that particular tool, they have it. So I, I really like that. I think um, w being a mentally tough tennis player means that you are a problem solver and you've got options um, and having all those tools and knowing that you have that make is going to make you feel more confident because if plan A isn't working the way that you generally play, you have all these different other options of ways that you can play to respond to whoever you're playing against. And I think that sort of gets to where he was saying this is chess and not checkers, right? Absolutely. So, I, you know, my hope is that our listeners realize the necessity of playing with intention and purpose using those tools to break down our opponents, to make them less comfortable, and, and to try to be a little bit less consumed with what's going on with ourselves. Yep, absolutely. So once again, thank you to Jorge Campestani for joining us on the podcast today. For more on Jorge, please visit his website, which is capistanitennis.com. We'll put that in the show notes. Um, and if you go there, it'll lead you to his player's site and to his coach's site. So his player's site has a lot of free material for players, his coaches site, subscription site for, for coaches, and they have a lot of different drills there. Uh, so for more on today's episode, check out our show notes and description. Um, please subscribe to the Tennis IQ podcast on your platform of choice. Um, also subscribe to our YouTube channel, Tennis IQ podcast. We're putting all the episodes up there. If you have feedback or questions for Josh and I about the mental game, uh, please email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com or you can use the hashtag tennisiq on Twitter. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you soon.